appreciate you, Lucas, to tell, you know, to inform about, you know, the risk. Because be being a business owner is important to, to, especially when you are in the, you know, um, professional service, you want to make sure that all the data, everything is secure. Otherwise, you can get in big trouble. And so that's why. I wanted you to invite, I invite you to be here and share your knowledge with our clients and um, our team too. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm smiling right now, but it's actually a pretty scary topic. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to just share our knowledge. It, it is one of those uh, topics like parenting or self-improvement. Um, that regardless of who hears it, it's going to be, you know, the more people that can hear cybersecurity fundamentals and how to protect themselves is better. So thank you, Patra, um, and the Francis and Reeves team for, for making this happen. I know that we are, you also prepare for a special gift for our clients and also people who attend today. So we gonna have to stay tuned until the end to get that <laughs> surprise. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Oh, you are so welcome. Um, you, uh, Patrick, your your team has helped us so much. We've uh, been working with you for only about, I guess, two tax years. Um, so when this opportunity came up, I thought, yeah, this is a great way to kind of share something that we don't share with um, our other clients as as a thank you and just as a benefit to to your client base. Um, so yeah, we're we're very happy customers. Awesome, thank you. And also Lucas, he's also helping our company, you know, on the cybersecurity too. And we feel like, you know, feel safe for our clients to have all the information that they share with us because we take that very seriously. So I'm glad that we have him on our team. Excellent, yes, um, you're in good hands. Uh, some of our staff, uh, you know, well, we still make sure we get eight hours of sleep but it happens to be at different times of the day because cybersecurity never sleeps. Um, so it, it is critical, whoever you're using, that, that someone's looking out for you. Uh, Patrick, yeah, you let me know when you're ready. I know this is a lot of people's like lunch break, so I'm, I'm happy to get into it whenever you're ready. Yeah, let's dive into it because we have about 45 to an hour. I want to make sure that everybody gets all the, the good resources. And thank you so much for spending, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. The, your valuable time with us today. And we want to make sure that you get value out of this too. And I see that some of our client, Tammy, is here. And thank you for joining us, Tammy. And any other client that I, I don't see it um, on the camera, but welcome here. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Lucas, whenever you're ready. All right. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And we will get started here. And we understand that many, uh, th there are a few attendees that will also be watching the recording after the fact. Um, and when you get the recording, you are welcome to share this with employees as well. The more people that hear these, the better, I think. Um, there's going to be a mix of practical application for everyone and also some things that the business owners uh, should really consider uh, because of like company wide type of strategies. Um, so, uh, overall, I've really made this pretty action packed um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. But I do have to start on on a bit of a sad note. Um, we're going to be talking about the latest news right now. By the way, side note, this is the first time this year that I'm doing this talk. So we're using brand new content, uh, brand new data from 2023. So this is all uh, very pertinent information. And in fact, Monday, uh, the United States Treasury um, publicly announced this. I've been fought in the cybersecurity community. We've known about this for the last year or two um, from the CIA's uh, public you know, publications. But it was interesting to me that now the United States Treasury Secretary um, has publicly announced that the state-run and state-backed 
uh, basically hacking community has in fact placed malware across American electrical grids, water systems, and other critical infrastructure. This article came from uh, the Financial Times. And there's not much you and I can really do about this, but I wanted to share it to help you understand how widespread this is and that no one is immune. And some of these agencies are government-based, but really water systems and electrical grids are run by independent companies. They might be large companies, but listen, these companies have IT staff. These companies are doing the right thing, yet there uh, is confirmation that China, China has placed malware on these pieces of infrastructure. Um, I won't go down too far my news rabbit hole with you, but the reason that they think they're doing that is as a defensive move um, in case the United States wants to help Taiwan defend itself. Uh, should there ever be an invasion. So I don't think there's an immediate threat, but uh, China is certainly playing uh, its, its, its chess game right now. So that's what's happening on the macro scale. But we're all small business. Um, we are, you know, we're a small business ourselves, and we are laser focused on small business. And the fact is that 46% of all cyber breaches last year in 2023 uh, we're in the small business sector. This is not Fortune 500 companies or your, your local municipality, even though local cities are getting uh, compromised and hacked with cyber, uh, forgive me, with uh, ransomware as well. And the average impact is three and a half million dollars per incident, okay? Um, and so that's, that's, that's successful, a, a good size small business. But this is happening to small businesses of all sizes. And I'm going to share some more examples um, of that a little bit later. So this is a real threat. And with that, there's also this thing called AI. And it's not making anything easier because the scamming industry, the phishing industry, has the same access to chat GPT as we do. What we're using for brainstorming effective communication. Um, and as you many of you might know, Chat GPT can even speak or write with the voice of fill in the blank. You can say write blank with the voice of the Francis and Reeves um, you know, tone. And so they can go to a, a chat GPT right now can go read a company's website and then generate an email that makes it sound like it's coming from that company's website. It's terrifying, really. And so this is where the next evolution of our cybersecurity tools at Fuji are, are rooted. And we're ensuring that anything new that we're, we're offering to our customers is driven by AI because the techniques by the hackers are changing daily as well. Um, and a note on that is that I don't know if anyone knew this, but there is actually no government license or regulation for IT companies. There are many uh, essential services like the medical field, the financial field um, that have government licenses. You even need a government license to compare. I'm glad that there is a license for that because I take my hair very seriously, but I can't believe that even today there is no license that a company like Fuji has to get. So IT companies are a dime a dozen, and even if you're, you're using a trusted person um, or, or a trusted firm, no one's immune and anyone can kind of be an IT company if they want. And that's what we're trying to do differently here at Fuji. So just to share a bit about who we are, um, just, just for context, uh, this is the only slide about us, <laughs> is that we've been in business for 15 years. Uh, we've worked with massive companies like Inspire Brands. You know, they're a, a new parent company that 
now owns everything from uh, Buffalo Wild Wings to Dunkin' Donuts and Jimmy John's. We've worked with global ad agencies, um, even an airline company based here in Atlanta, and a very large fruit company that makes mobile phones. In fact, the fruit company that we worked with that hired us hired Fuji to create their global curriculum for Apple partners. Um, maybe I said too much because I let the name slip. Um, so Fuji is actively helping Apple with their global partner community to ensure that the standards are, are held high, you know, among the, the Apple community. Um, I know I haven't talked about Apple much yet. I'll talk about that actually um, here in a second. But what we've done over the years now is brought those enterprise techniques down to small business. That is our entire aim. We don't actually work intentionally. We don't work with those companies anymore. We decided about eight years ago to bring, we saw the opportunity and the, the breaches and just incidents that were happening, uh, not even breaches, but like former employees, maliciously or not, making things difficult for a small business owner. Um, and there's just a huge opportunity to help small businesses. So that's really uh, our aim. And so, yes, we do specialize in Apple. That's why we were, why we started. Uh, however, we serve all computers, including Windows. Um, so that's why we have kind of an Apple bent in how we see things. However, the world really runs on Windows and we can still be friends and we can still take care of you. So. That's a little bit about us. So my goal today is to inform you about today's risks, and I want to provide actionable, actionable steps throughout. I'm not going to have you guys wait until the end to learn what to actually do with each topic. I'm going to be showing you actionable steps. Um, so hopefully this will be uh, impactful. You can do right away. And I also want to meet you. Getting to know small business owners is a blast. Um, we, you know, we can always share common stories, and this is what, what inspires us to work every day. So these are our goals uh, for the next few minutes. So I told you at the beginning, this whole topic is kind of scary. Uh, it's terrifying. And when you look at the numbers, it doesn't really help things. But I do want to illustrate kind of the reality. This has actually changed a lot since COVID. Um, and I'll... I'll I'll share why. What happened during COVID is that this is going to sound off the, off the wall, but crime rings that were involved with drug, drug trafficking and uh, human trafficking actually had a business problem. People weren't leaving their homes. And so, like a good business should, Crime rings globally started to diverge. This meeting is being recorded. Ah, now we're recording. Okay. Oh, <laughs> it, that, don't worry. It's recording because I have Phantom here. So okay. it's recording anyway. That's just on Zoom. Oh, good. Excellent. Um, <laughs> can you guys see that banner or should I get rid of it? Um, banner? Which banner? Okay, good. So that's just on me. Here we go. Okay. So... What's crazy about how crime rings in the drug trafficking industry and human trafficking industry are affecting cyber security and cyber attacks is that during COVID, everyone stayed home and they were losing revenue. So they had to re-strategize and pivoted to cybersecurity. So what they've done now is uh, forced Unfortunately, um, innocent people and baiting them into jobs and then threatening them uh, with their lives to implement cybersecurity scams and do phishing scams. Um, a fantastic uh, TV episode to watch on this is, uh, of all people, it was John Oliver. And regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, John Oliver had a segment just a couple of weeks ago um, on a topic called pig butchering, which has nothing to do with pigs. 
Um, and it's basically about cybersecurity. I highly recommend um, watching it on Max or at least YouTubing that video. Um, it's a great time, you know, uh, bring bring your family around to watch it because it's really scary. Uh, don't really bring your family around to watch it. But he goes into great detail about what's happening. Um, and effectively, what's, what's happened since COVID is crime rings have used their skill set in human trafficking to create scam centers and threatening the families of the of these innocent people looking for jobs um, and forcing them to come to work just like a, a, a healthy crime syndicate would or else, you know, um, the, they'll cause harm to them and their family. So the scammers aren't mean people. They're not bad people. Um, they're actually trying, you know, their hardest uh, to get out of the situation they're in. And the latest headline I read was uh, from this week about this. So. That is why we've seen a 400% growth in cyber attacks, and we don't think that's getting any slower, especially with AI. So let's talk about phishing. It is still the number one cybersecurity risk today. Um, what's wild is that the, the industry doesn't know where a quarter of attacks are coming from. Like, you know, we've heard of phishing, how someone uh, sends you an email pretending to be someone else. And the reason why they're unknown is that the phishing attempts have changed their behavior. What's happening now is hackers are, are gaining into an email account, possibly your email account, okay? Possibly an employee's email account. And they're actually sitting quiet for six months to a year before they start their scheme, before they actually go in uh, to compromise a bank account or something like that. And it's so, so much time has passed that a lot of logs uh, are, are purged. And so therefore the cybersecurity experts don't know, can't really confirm how they got in. Does that make sense? because they're just sitting for so long. And so um, that's another threat is like, you may not think you are currently being compromised, but you could be in the middle of a compromise as it stands now. Um, and we'll talk more about how we can mitigate that risk because it is scary. And this type of uh, risk, phishing doesn't care if you're Mac or PC because these are happening on the web, right? With passwords, uh, with online accounts, with um, behavior uh, modification, trying to, to scan your clients out of money as well. Um, so this, this threat really doesn't care what computer you or your employees are using. And an example is a Mac firm that came to us after the fact. They're a three-person law firm. You know, a lot of us don't think that we are of any concern for hackers because we're too small, right? But it's happening everywhere. And this three person law firm uh, was compromised um, in, in a transaction where they're, they, they were given, uh, basically the hackers were given information about their escrow account. And the hackers were then able to flush the $47,000 that were inside of their escrow account. Hacks aren't as blatant, or they don't, they're not always as blatant as this one. This is like an earlier one where they're gaining your access and your, you know, credentials to do that transfer. They're getting more sophisticated now. Um, and a recent example was with a creative agency. And what's interesting about this is you think creative agencies are full of hipsters and millennials, and they know how to use computers, right? What happened here was the example that I gave on the last slide. There was a, a hacker that gained access to the CEO's inbox and just listened for weeks. And what they ended up doing is also gaining access to the accountant's inbox. And what they did 
was very interesting. They were actually sent emails on behalf of the accountant to their clients telling them that uh, their bank account information had changed to please send payment for invoices to this new bank, send all wires here. So our new client that came to us uh, within a matter of weeks said, hey, um, we, you know, we were just figuring all this out. We thought our clients were just overdue, right? So they didn't know that they were part of the scam. Um, but in fact, they, they, they were, so they were out $280,000 of invoices that never came to them. So these don't always look the same way. Phishing doesn't always look the same way. Um, and that's why there are a lot of ways to protect against phishing. Um, there's so many ways. On this slide, I had to make two columns. <laughs> so um, I'll go quickly, and you're welcome to take a screenshot of this slide if you like. If you don't know how to do a screenshot, you're talking to the right people. And just contact us after this, and we will show you how to take screenshots. Um, it's very helpful when doing webinars. So. The first thing is more of a decision that the business owner needs to make, and that's to enroll in a dark web monitoring service. If so you're an employee listening to this, there's not much you can do here um, except advocate for this. And what we can do is detect when an email address at your company is available on the dark web. So there's a service we're using that's scouring the dark web daily for these passwords. And it might be um, a, a company password, it might be a target.com password, um, but regardless, we get notified when um, any personal information is compromised and your IT company should absolutely offer this service. The next is employee simulation. And I didn't write the word training for a reason. Yes, employee training is good, right? And that's why we're all here. So, um, Patra, again, thank you for just making this content available. But now, a really cool tool that we have actually does simulated phishing. And we can see which employees fell for the trick and clicked on the link. So it's a simulated campaign um, so that we can help with you know, realistic emails to, to our clients. And then advanced email analysis is another one. And this is a more complex phrase, but what I mean is a spam filter here. Um, I didn't use the word spam filter because everyone thinks they have a spam filter, like with Microsoft or with Google. However, those are pretty basic uh, when it comes to actually uh, protecting against phishing. So, Can I ask you a question, Lucas? Yes, please. When you say they're not that efficient, can you give me an example to realize how non-efficient it really is? Oh, yes, good question. Um, so what they might do is look for certain rules, like this is from a Gmail account, you know? And also with what Google or Microsoft might do is, oh, we've seen that email 100,000 times today across all of these other customers. And so we know that's a spam. So they're not useless. They are, they are helping. However, what an advanced like third party service will use, we use one called Avanon. It used uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to learn how that company typically does emails to help inform when there's an anomaly, okay? Um, so with hundreds of emails that, and it literally, it takes two weeks to learn your company. So it's learning on a company by company basis. Um, so it's highly sp specific to, to your firm. And so it will, um, and they're moving a lot faster. Basically, they'll also make sure that um, their the email address name doesn't look similar, like have uh, character similarities with other users in the domain. So for example, my name is Lucas and 
if other people are getting emails from a Lucas, it marks that. And don't ask me why, but Microsoft and Google don't always catch those. It's, it's strange, but that's like the number one of the most, I won't say number one, but one of the most common scams is an email from the, the owner or the CEO. So um, basically not even close to being sufficient. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, and I need to work on being a bit more um, cutthroat. So thank you for that. Not even close for being sufficient. Um, yeah. These these services, yeah, are, have always just been a year or two behind. And when we're dealing with phishing, uh, that's why there's a few products out there. I really would prefer companies to use an AI driven uh, um, product. And so Avanon is one. Graphis is another one. Um, it's G R A P H Graphis. So uh, whether it's it's you directly or with a an IT company running it, I do recommend a third party spam filter that uses AI. So thanks for for popping into that question. Um, you st still need unique passwords for all of your um, accounts, and we're going to talk about the best way to get unique passwords. So that if one is compromised, you only have to reset one. And let's face it, we're, everyone's getting compromised these days. Like recently, Callaway Golf Clubs got comp compromised. And so uh, like 10 million of their customers that shopped on their website, um, well, passwords were compromised. So anyone that was using their Callaway Golf Club password anywhere else, you know, is in a bad spot. So that's why we want unique passwords. Another pro tip, is any uh, we've the whole cybersecurity community has moved away from resetting your passport every 90 days, or every six months, or even every year. Um, what we found out was that that was creating bad habits, and was creating more memorable passwords, <laughs> because people were just like changing one digit on the end of their password, and it's very easy uh, for bots, like computerized hackers, to to go through those. Um, those different combinations. So just stay with your password, um, but make sure it's really strong, uh, long, and unique, which we'll we have, I have a slide on that later. And the next item to protect against phishing is to enforce MFA or two-factor authentication. Um, I want to emphasize enforce. Every time we talk to clients and new prospects, they their answer is like, yeah, well, we do that. However, a lot of them only have it enabled and it's not enforced for every user. And so what we wanna make sure, what we recommend you, your IT company does is enforce it on your email platform, if you use Dropbox, if you use Slack, any you know, share file, whatever web service your company uses, or if you use 10 of them, ensure, have, have your IT person go into all of those settings and make sure that they are enforcing MFA for every user, okay? That's critical. Without this, you're wide open to uh, an overseas hacker um, to get your your email or your your password on the dark web and uh, and go after your account, which goes back to that first bullet is have dark web monitoring. Uh, most most email hacks occur within I think it's a three or four days of a password being available on the dark web, like a leaked database. And so you really like timing is is really important when it comes to getting notified of when you when something has been compromised. So if you ever get those alerts, if one of your insurance products you have have something similar for your personal family stuff, reset those passwords right away because that's when you're most at risk is when you get that alert. All right, last one on this page is for the business owner. This has to be done on your domain name, okay? Um, won't go into too much detail here, but you want to absolutely make sure that DMARC and DDKIM have been set up for your email domain. And that protects scammers from using your domain against you. <laughs> okay. Um, it makes sure that, that it's a verified uh, email domain. Not only is it good for your own security, however, uh, in but in Google, 
and I think Microsoft as well, starting this month in March, or it might have been February of this year, started to enforce uh, DMARC and DKIM for every one of their email customers. So I'm going to say this right. They don't turn it on for you. But what they do is if a company doesn't have it turned on, you're going to be marked as spam. Uh, so it's also good from a sales and marketing perspective uh, to make sure that DMARC and DKIM is enabled for your company. Okay. Any questions there on, on phishing? We're all phishing experts now, right? I have a quick question, Lucas. Yes. So in our company, we use Google Drive and we also share some information like Google Doc or Google uh, Sheet to our clients. Is it safe to share those documents uh, to outside the organization? Excellent question. Yes, it is safe to do so. Um, however, everyone is, is basically, the weakest link is each person's login, you know? So everyone is doing it at, at their own risk, if you will. Um, so I love, by the way, that you guys use Google Drive. You speak my language. I love how efficient uh, it is to, to complete our stuff. The good news is if one of your clients is compromised, like their Google account is compromised, that doesn't affect you or your clients. So I, I can say that assuredly that Google or, or Microsoft online documents will ensure protection against your other clients. However, they are their security is up to them right so does that answer your question patrick yeah i think what um i mean my understanding is just on that certain document it doesn't mean that they can by sharing uh, the document will um make it our domain name vulnerable right it's just the matter of that certain documents only but in our firm we don't use um you know confidential information through the gmail anyway we use it through like a secure portal so in that case we are safe yes you are safe okay uh, all right you'll be the first Thank to you. know if if uh, i receive a request that doesn't look watertight um yeah, yeah you guys are doing great yeah thank you for confirming that yes and to that point, uh, anyone listening, you want to make sure if you're using Google Drive for your business or Microsoft OneDrive that you have MFA enforced. Because um, that, that is kind of the, your password is your weakest link, and then MFA is your next weakest link um, to gain access to, to your files. Okay. So now we're going to talk about ransomware very briefly. Um, it's still a thing. It's crazy. In fact, it's like the it, it grew 95% last year. It's the second fastest growing attack vector, which is a fancy way of saying the, the method of attack. Um, yeah, right behind phishing. So it's still rampant. And the most recent news here was, uh, was it United Health? Is that right? Like their pharmacy. Um, division on the East Coast was compromised, and they just had to shut down their entire operation for uh, two weeks. And a lot of medical practices lost a lot of revenue and cash flow because uh, tens of thousands of businesses rely on a payment processing by United Health. So uh, ransomware is alive and well, uh, unfortunately, and also doesn't uh, ransomware doesn't care if you are on a Mac or, or a PC. Now, if ransomware um, affects your company, if you're ever hit by it, don't pay. Okay? Only 4% of attacks uh, actually get their data back whenever they pay. Okay? So... You might say, I've got a million dollars I could give them or $200,000 if it's a small time crook. But they only uh, give back data just in, or yeah, give back your data just enough to, to make it seem like a plausible option. But chances are you're not getting that data back. So I'll touch on this in another slide, but you're better off just saying no thanks, 
calling your amazing IT company and restoring your data, okay? Um, back to that, that point. But what's done is done, just move on. Um, what's really sad is that a month later, your company's data is going on the dark web anyway. This is the trend we're seeing uh, that what they are, uh, you know, uh, offering a ransom for is actually going to be auctioned off anyway, because now the hackers have a pot of gold. And when there's a crime ring that has a pot of gold uh, right in front of them with your data, they're going to want to to make use of that as fast as they can. So uh, the, the lesson here is that it's actually better not to get hacked with ransomware. <laughs> okay, so you can't pass it off to say, oh, I'm backed up. My IT guy says, we're good, we got good backups. Because um, that's just not true. I would much prefer you not get hacked, okay? It's like the hack is just step one um, because th there's gonna be a lot of damage coming coming later. So, okay, we're gonna get nerdy for just, if this isn't nerdy enough for you already, but we're gonna go a little deeper on how ransomware is entering companies, all right? Is it through phishing? No, this is something separate, actually. This is not necessarily through an email scan. The most popular way ransomware is getting in to your company is through software vulnerabilities, okay? I'll talk about semi-trucks in just a second. But a software vulnerability is like your webcam. If you're using an external USB webcam, or if you have a printer in your home office, heck, even if your refrigerator connects to the internet, um, anything that connects to the internet needs software updates, right? We all have to like re update our iPhones every now and then. Patch is another term the industry uses to patch your computer with updates. The way ransomware is infiltrating is by knowing that most people don't update their software. So they go after, I'm pointing over here because that's where my printer is. They go after an old HP printer to get in, okay? Or they go after one that was very popular for you just a couple of years ago was Zoom. There was a Zoom update, or uh, yeah, that fixed, an update that fixed this issue where an attacker could could gain control of a computer. And what they mean by that is install malware or ransomware. Um, so basically anything that connects to the internet needs software updates. And that means anything that connects to the internet can be compromised with ransomware, okay? And why I say semi-trucks is because I just read yesterday that the driving uh, computers, there's like mileage computers, every semi truck uh, in the country that updates like how many hours a day, we're talking truck drivers are driving, right? Per day, what time they started, what time they stopped, uh, what, how fast they were going. And it's, an, it's actually a federal regulation. Funny that that is regulated, uh, but we are not. The little computers sitting in tens of thousands of semi trucks on the highways today have a vulnerability, and there is um, a hack being spread, malware being spread, uh, going from truck to truck because it's using the Bluetooth beacon to nearby trucks and and compromising that little driving computer. So again, that was to illustrate that nothing is immune from software vulnerabilities. And that's why your IT company should be updating and enforcing updates for everyone, even you, the owner. I know owners and CEOs don't like their computer touched, but everyone needs to be on the same cadence of software updates. Um, and Apple's not immune either. These little dot updates that Apple comes out with, like, um, it just says like for software vulnerabilities, Apple won't say what that threat is, but please update your iPhone software uh, as well as soon as you see this. Okay, so 
we're nearing the end here for for ransomware um, issues. And the issue here is it's it's funny. I'm actually naming two of the best products for ransomware protection for companies. However, that's only 20% of the solution. Our SOC, which I'll touch on in a second, our Security Operations Center, has actually seen numerous compromises because companies are using Sentinel One or CrowdStrike, which are great products, but there was an issue installing it, or oh, this person's computer isn't reporting back properly, or there was one checkbox that wasn't enabled. So, um, I like it how one of my my team members put it earlier when when I was talking to them this week. They said, you know, I buy all the parts for a bookshelf, but you don't want me building that bookshelf. That's just not who I am, and it's not going to be a very stable bookshelf. Well, just because you have the right product doesn't mean it's being used effectively and enforced 100% across your company. So this is how uh, a lot of ransomware is is happening. Oh, and yeah, we we our our SOC recently had two incidents uh, where an IT company was managing the EDR, which is like the industry term for Sentinel One and CrowdStrike. That's called an EDR product. Um, however, there were there were breaches because those EDR products were were misconfigured. So, not all IT companies are built the same. So, real quick. How to protect yourself against ransomware. Make sure your company's data is being replicated somewhere. So even if you use Google um, or OneDrive, it's still safe. Uh, it's still recommended that you use a backup service. I know that sounds wild for the cloud, but you actually back that data up to a separate cloud. Okay, and your IT company should have, there are a few options out there for IT companies um, to replicate your cloud data. Make sure that your EDR product um, has ransomware detection. Again, that's not the whole story. You need a good person running it and configuring it, um, but at least make sure it's not just antivirus. Antivirus is like the 90s term. EDR is the next generation um, that it, it, it's more complex and make sure that it has uh, ransomware whenever you're shopping around. So. Again, SOC is an acronym for a security operations center. Um, we're not the only ones, and many IT companies can get a SOC service, um, or they might have one internally where they are running 24-7 and are looking at these alerts and responding within 15 minutes if there is an anomaly that's detected. So make sure that your SOC team uh, is configuring those products correctly and make sure that your SOC team is responding immediately. This is not, this is different than, hey, my, my printer won't work or my computer isn't turning on. Make sure that the security related incidents have a very fast response time, okay? Okay, any questions on ransomware before we move on to passwords? We are on the home stretch here. And I want to leave a few more questions at the end for Q&A. Um, but yeah, we're, we're good on time. So passwords are still important. This is not, um, uh, this is actually just one slide here. And I wanted to give you an update of where passwords are today in 2024. What should you do? Um, for your passwords, like your computer, that you, you, you can't put in a password app, password manager, just make sure it's long. Um, I love to use a phrase with some punctuation in there. So make sure it's memorable. Like if you really love candles, um, you can say, I love candles and throw in a number in there with an exclamation mark. Um, you just throw in your fra fragrance as well. Like I love bergamot candles, right? You won't forget that. And it's very long. So that's really the best way if, it's also faster to type, right? You don't want to be like sitting at, at Publix with all these crazy characters, like flipping your keyboard back and forth. So just having a long password is, is very, very strong, okay? Well, I guess you live in the South if you're referencing Publix. You figured me out. Yes. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're we're based here in Atlanta, but we do have um, a, a few offices in the southeast, and then one in Colorado. So, um, but yes, I personally am here in Hotlanta. So use unique passwords, and if you're not using a password manager, you need to be. I'm going to give you a quick demo about how it works. It's very brief, but I want to show you how your password manager, if it's a good one, can also do MFA, right? We all, it adds an extra step to type in that six digit code. And so what I'm gonna do is just visit a website right here. I got my browser up um, and a lot, okay. We're just gonna visit our ticketing system here. And you'll see it already filled in my username. Oh, here we go. Actually, the, the website remembers my username. Okay. It Lucas, yes. sorry. I saw that you used one password because there are many uh, options in the market, like LastPass, one password, and many companies. Would you recommend one password versus other company, or what do you think? I would, um, and I have a link to get a trial also uh, here in, a, in one of the slides. But... There's two reasons. The first reason is that the other ones have reported breaches. Like the most recent one was LastPass. Um, well, it's I, had like, mm -hmm. I think two breaches in the last few years. So, I mean, breaches happen to everyone. So I, I'm not like too surprised, but one password has not ever been compromised, which is pretty cool. The second one is more on philosophy. A lot of the other services have free tiers. And when there's a free tier, that either means like you're, you're having to pay for that in some ways. So they're probably using your activity and selling that to marketing companies. I think your passwords are still safe with LastPass or Gazelle, I think is another one. But I love that they're free because that means they're using your habits to sell to marketing companies. You know, so I like to pay for the best product. And one password also is always really good about like, the iPhone latest iPhone features like Face ID, they were they came out right away with that or uh, Touch ID on the Mac, so th they are our favorite one. But at least be using something, okay? But I just want to give you a quick uh, login demo. So when I hit continue, what's cool is one password filled it in automatically for me without me having to choose it, and it's about to autofill that that temporary code, so I can log in to my ticketing system without having to fiddle with a password manager at all, okay? Um, so this is just one of our internal sites, but I wanted to give a, just that, that quick demo of how 1Password feels. This is my personal 1Password. The other reason I really like it is I have um, a Fuji account with multiple vaults and I can share, my COO has access to one vault and then my COO and my finance director have access to another vault for our finances. So all of our passwords for shared accounts are immediately updated um, if someone does have to reset a password. And then I also have one for my family that I used for my wife, uh, which is really good just for like succession planning. It's a bit morbid, but if something ever happens to me or her, we will have each other's target.com accounts. Um, or mortgage and bills and like all that important stuff. So it's really elegant. And if I search right here, um, there we go. See, I have my wife's uh, Mango account. Um, if I ever needed that for some reason, it, anything that she's creating is also saved, you know, in here. So I really love one password. And let me flip back to the presentation. Just what you just said earlier, we can add that to our to like a checklist for our client. You know, when you're talking about sharing the password, because that's also important. If something happened to one, you know, either husband or wife, they can at least can pay for mortgage, right? So that's a good point. Like, I pay the family's plan comes out to a few dollars, four to six ish dollars a month, but I pay it annually, and it, it's just. Like life insurance, as I see it, um, or if I'm traveling and she might need a certain membership account, we use 1Password as like our safe. Um, 
we don't have a safe in our family. I'm like letting everyone know all of <laughs> our, our how we operate. Everything is digital and inside of one password. So even our Delta Sky Miles number, our Costco membership number is inside of one password. Okay. Um, so it, it really just helps you be digital. And if you're forgetful like me, it's it's fantastic that it's always on my phone as well. So um, if you want to schedule a call with us afterward, we're happy to share this URL with you as well, or you can do a screenshot, but it's basically bit.ly slash um, Fuji one password will get you a free trial of that for your business. Okay, I have one more scam I'm gonna share and then it's Q&A because this has nothing to do with businesses, but it's happening now. And what's happening with AI is scammers are taking audio recordings from your family members and calling you masquerading as your family member, as an aunt you talk to once a year, as your parents. And they are basically asking, um, yeah, questions and needing help with a certain, you know, they're in a crisis situation. <laughs> and they're using that to take advantage um, and have you send money to them, like through PayPal or something like that. So look out for it. Um, there was an article in the New Yorker um, on AI created voice scams. That is like the latest thing that's out. It's happening more on the consumer side. We haven't seen anything on the business side because it's happening over phone calls, right? And what's the, the most vulnerable way you can get to someone is through a family member, right? So um, it, it's, it's wild and the, this article went into length on how that's working. Can I share something on that, Lucas, real fast? And I want you to tell me if this is exactly what you created. Okay. So this was like four months ago. I get a random call from Texas. And they're claiming that um, they need to send a package from Mexico. And they mention my sister's name. And, and I'm like, well, first of all, like, who is this? And like, what do you need? And it was just a really weird response. But it, the person goes, is this Allison's brother? And I was like, who is? So I didn't answer it. I just said, who is this? And again, because they couldn't be directing me, I just hung up. Yep. But for months, I've been thinking about that had to be a scam. And what you just created basically encompasses exactly what that was. Yes. That's exactly what happened. And if they might have had um, like a, a, an accent, a local Latin American accent, they can now, yeah, that scam, it weren't, they weren't using your sister's voice like this one, because that's also terrifying. But yeah, you can just have the accent be like standard American accent yeah. or whatever. Or, or it sounds like maybe they were recording my voice to then use to, for, to call Allison or something. It has, and it's crazy yeah like that is technically possible i haven't heard of that happening but however they get your voice if your facebook account is public you know and people can just watch a video of you i don't get too scared about it because you can you can get very scared about this and then say all right i'm never i'm taking down all my videos that are online right now yeah. but i don't i don't think that that's the right response um because, yeah, that's just not the way to live, in my, in my opinion. But, um, you know, these risks are real and they're getting out. So just follow those first principles of like hanging up like you did. Call your sister back. Or I did that. That wasn't her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's really the only way to protect yourself is don't answer. Like, just for me, I don't answer any calls anymore um, that aren't in my contacts. Uh, but also, yeah, call back the person before any any money is changing hands, you know. Um, so that about wraps it up. Um, and I want to just leave a few minutes for for some Q and A. And I just wanted to to let you know that our SOC is powered by former CIA, Army, and NSA um, cybersecurity specialists. 
where they actually like for their job was to hack into other countries. So this stuff is happening. It's very real. Um, and we want to focus on your growth and security. That's what we do here at Fuji. And exclusively available for um, attendees of this, like Patrick said at the beginning, we decided to do something we, we have never done before and just offer um, a free assessment. We'll do a, a call where we, we have a series of questions that we ask and then provide you with a report on, on vulnerabilities and kind of our highest priorities. Whether you want to use us or not, that's totally fine, but we're happy to do that complimentary um, just for the Francis and Reeves clients. So thank you so much. I'll open it up to any questions you have. Thank you so much, Lucas, for the special offer. That's like the value of 225. That's very great. And we can also send out like on the email newsletter and um, send to all, to all of our clients too. And also the video recording of this. Excellent. Yeah. Um, those are always very informative just to get a health check um, mm -hmm. on how you're doing or how your IT company is doing. It's a, it's a great way. And we know that yeah, no one's immune. So um, if it's the right, if you have the right IT team, they would be happy to get a health check uh, by another mm -hmm. cybersecurity firm. Yeah. So we're gonna open for the question. Anyone have any questions here? That's maybe you can share also share experience, and we can maybe Lucas can give some suggestion. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Like, uh, let me just also verbalize if you go to fuji.com slash contact that'll book a call with uh one of our directors here josh graves and we'll know you can just say you're a client of of uh francis and reeves and we'll verify that to make sure you get that discount um but what the audit will cover is everything from who runs your your internet at your business um are your employees working um, in a brick and mortar building or are they remote because that really changes your your security posture and what you should consider um, you know do you use MFA currently for all of your online services so it is like a physical we're we're just going to ask uh, we don't need access to any of your things so you are not having to give us credentials to anything um, yeah, what we're going to do is just ask questions and kind of give that free advice along with with a one pager of how you can plug up any holes that you currently have. Lucas, I do have a quick question. I'm sorry if I, I missed it. I don't think I heard it, but with with the passwords, I know you said that well, we went away with like doing it every 90 days or every however often. Um, is there like a rule of thumb now on what like do do we just keep the passwords and just make sure they're unique or they follow the criteria? Yes. Um, I say say that hesitatingly. Um, you, I would really strongly first recommend you have a password manager, right, to make sure that it's a long hash. And if you're doing that with multi-factor authentication then even if that password gets compromised they'll still need your mfa app or code to log into your account so is it good to change a password yeah like no one will ever stop say it's a bad thing to if you want to set a calendar reminder or an alarm once a year for like your five most important accounts go for it um it was just, it was like the, the Freakonomics book. W what happened was that changing passwords uh, incentivized lazy passwords, right? So just don't get lazy with passwords. And yes, uh, you're welcome to change it. I place trust in our tools. So I, I have the dark web uh, alerts. You know, my team notifies me when that happens. So I can change that one password if that's compromised. Um, however, for important passwords, yes, you're welcome to change them annually if you want, and then make sure that they're all unique. That's the other crazy thing is people that are still memorizing their passwords. You're, it, you know, that's that's not a secure place to be. 
I only have a couple of passwords memorized that I have to type, you know? Other than that, my, my passwords are like 16 characters uh, of garble that make no sense. Um, I don't know my bank passwords. I don't know my, my investment account passwords, my mortgage password. It's all just kept by one password. And then if that's a new concept for anyone listening, what happens if, if I stop using one password or can't get access to one password? It's all right. You just reset your password. And you, you know, they go through the, the identity identity verification process of like your social security number, and you can establish a new password if for some reason, you know, you're unable to to get access to one password. Yeah, I would have something to add to that. If you have to remember memorize all the password, you are probably gonna create your your some stress too because you, you already have to remember so many tasks and many things, and if you have to add more like because your password should be like all the website should be different so and you should not use just like all your bank account in the same password either that's why when you use uh one password or any other um password software it's gonna help you a lot and you know it's not gonna be like just like a short sentence that a hacker can guess or somebody who really know you can guess and hack into your bank account or something yeah, that's a, a great point. You shouldn't memorize any passwords, really. And so this is one password. I can, you know, we have uh, our family's passport. You can create all sorts of, like, little accounts here. But I'm going to create a new, like, just generic login um, with my work email. And then when you click password, you can create a new one. And you can make it longer if you want. But uh, 16 is pretty good. I would not do 8 anymore. 8 can be cracked in about 24 hours now. Um, if someone was out to get you, an eight-character password is very easy to get through now. So I would at least do 12. Um, numbers and symbols are great. I hate it when when some online companies don't let you have 16 characters. They force you to have, like, less than 12. Um, some older companies, but, yeah, the longer the better right there for your passwords and complex. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Lucas. Because I have another meeting at two, I don't, I'm not sure if anyone else have uh, any more questions. Can I ask something really quick, Katra? Yes, please, Marie. Uh, so, Lucas, I have a VPN and I'm super paranoid about Wi Fi. So, whenever I do any work, I use my, my desktop that's actually hardwired. <laughs> I don't run it off Wi Fi. <laughs> Am I do is that helping me or is it just something that I just made up in my mind that I think it's good to do for cybersecurity? Hey, you know, if everyone in the world was like you, um, we would have less incidents. So good on you. Um, I personally use Wi-Fi at my house. So if you have a long Wi-Fi password, then chances are it's gonna be really hard to crack that. Okay. Um and it also depends like where you live in a dense environment or in an apartment building. Yeah, there could there could be people that are trying to to crack your network. I live in in like a single family home where if there was someone trying to crack, like I will see them in the street, right? Um, so it kind of depends where you live, but you're doing the right things. And I think as long as you have um, a a long password, you're doing really well. And to give you a bit of peace of mind, if you like wish that you could be wireless, I would recommend the Eero brand product. Uh, Eero's have a security subscription that's a hundred bucks a year. And that mm -hmm. would let you know if there are suspicious devices on your network. So little side note, if someone does get on your network, Marlene, they mm -hmm. can't do it invisibly. And so what I also like about Eero is it lets me know every time someone joins my network. And so just having that, I can see when like a family member drives up to my driveway because their iPhone connects to my network. Um, so that might give you a bit more peace of mind. And so that, that's what I would, maybe, maybe that's why I have such peace of mind. Yeah, is that I know when someone connects to my network. And so therefore Wi-Fi is great. How do you spell that, Lucas? Euro? E uh, it's it's two e's. So 
E E oh, Eero. E E R O. They were acquired by Amazon a few years ago, mm. which gave me some concern. But they've been do, doing really strong the last three years since then. So Amazon isn't like changing them. I think Amazon is going to run them as an independent brand, and they're still like the, uh, in my opinion, for residential environments, the best Wi-Fi to get. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. All, All right. right. I you have to go. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to say quickly, I appreciate um, the learning experience today. I'm so careful with everything at work, but you really made me realize that I'm not careful with any of my personal life. So, um, you know, using my last name for everything is probably oh. good and you should, uh, you know, rethink that. <laughs> so You're going to have to change that. <laughs> yes. Um, use a password manager. Um, and that's really where a lot of the anxiety goes away, is if you just have those unique ones that you can't memorize. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Lucas. And um, we can have, I'm going to give the recording to Megan and then give uh, have Megan send you an email with the recording too. So maybe you can use it for other pur purposes too. But I have to go because I already late for a few minutes. <laughs>